everyone. And uh, for this conference in a glue, f I'm glad you've all stuck around for the end. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, as the, the last talk, I'm presenting some results that were done on some twin disc tests with our colleagues in uh, Colombia, uh, Juan and Paula Alejandro, and then there's Peter, me, and Roger in Sheffield who've been uh, involved with this project with the uh, Metro de Medellin, who are looking at putting different rails into their system to solve some of the problems they're having. Uh, so, road contact fatigue is a problem, we all know that. That's a quick slide at the end of the... If this had been the first day, that would have been relevant, but today it's not relevant. Um, so we're using our twin disc test machine, um, sitting in this noisy cupboard. It looks really light and nice there, but it's really dark and miserable. Um, we're looking at tests at 1% creepage, 1.3 gigapascals at 400 RPM. We're taking the rail discs from rail materials, at the standard R260, a couple of harder politic grades, and a, another two that I'm not allowed to tell you what they are, um, which you maybe would guess. Um, so we've got an, an E8 wheel, which has been provided by the Metro system in Medellin. Um, we run the tests and afterwards calculate the mass loss, crack growth rate in uh, micrometers per cycle, and various take pictures, all the sorts of things you should do after your tests. Um, so for these tests, we wanted to look at some aggressive rolling contact fatigue damage. So this technique of running a dry test for 8,000 cycles. So during these cycles, the surface roughness develops, you get some micro cracks. And then after that, we start adding water. We're dripping on at about um, um, uh, uh, an eighth of a litre per second. Eighth of a millilitre per second. Yeah, that'd be good. Eighth of a millilitre per second, which we run up for another 12,000. So there's 20,000 cycles in all. And then after the test, we're taking some samples out and sectioning like here to look at the um, depth of the um, deformed zone on the surface and to do some micro hardness tests. So that is a, a way of accelerating testing and trying to look at rolling contact fatigue damage, not just wear. So these tests are for the, the five rail materials and we can see the wear rates. So the lower blocks are for the rail. Um, after 8,000 cycles, you have a very low wear rate before you apply the water. Then after 20,000 cycles, that's the average wear over the cycles, um, including the eight at the beginning. So actually during the wet cycles, it's more than that. Um, so those are both the rail, and the little black ones are for the wheel, and you can see not a lot of difference uh, what we've got there. So we've got about four times the amount of wear for these, um, these softer standard rail compared to the hard rail. So I plotted that. I think it's an easy way to look at it. Um, we have the rail hardness, this micro-indent Vickers test at the end, for the, the new rail material there, so as the range is plotted, and then you can see each material against the hardness that was measured after the test. And this is the wet wear rate. And you can see quite a nice straight line for increasing, um, increasing hardness, reducing the wear. So when you get hardness over here, you'll actually be growing I mean, must be a trend you can extrapolate. So that's what we're aiming for. Wheels that get, that get bigger, rail that gets bigger as it wears. Um, these other materials have 
don't fit on the curve. They're very different microstructures and going to behave differently. Um, so that is for the rail after 20k. So the next plots use this axis. Um, I don't know. It seemed a good idea to put more on one. Um, but so now we're looking. I've put on the the rail after the dry cycles, and you can see you have a kind of trend, with a, a less of a slope, but you still have that same trend with hardness for the dry rail. So this, is, this axis is a tenth of that one, so approximately a tenth of the wear for the dry, and the wheels are also about a tenth. So this question about whether harder rail materials affects wheel wear, so from these tests, um, you've got some very small error bars on these, um, but the wheel for these materials is obviously the wear is increasing. So for those of you who are in Rogers talk, talk about typical conditions, the word you missed out was typical dry conditions. So this is typical with some water. And now we have a, an increase, but it's an increase on a very small um, yeah, very small amount. Okay, um, so these are the surfaces that came out um, typically from the tests. So you can see the 260, once you get the water in there, you're getting massive damage on the surface. The 350 uh, were very localized. Not quite sure why that happened. Maybe there was some um, particles that came loose and did some severe abrasion in this area and that localized all the damage. Um, so the contact seems to have stayed localized where that um, contact was happening. The 400, you got quite a smooth surface still after the tests. And these, these two do, do what they do. Um, so the pictures, um, we have some cracking indicating with the blue lines and the depth of the hardness layers. So this was found by looking at the, um, the lemeli on the micrographs and also like plotting the hardness through the depth just to see where the hardness finished. That's what those look like. And then I've got the plot of what happened to the hardness for the different, wear mater different materials before and after the test. So your, the hardness at a, a fixed depth below the surface because obviously you're wearing different amounts away. Um, and the thickness of the deformed layer. So again, plot it against hardness. So the 260 is the, in the middle here. And there's other two rail materials. You can see you have a similar initial hardness but then how much you move up. So this is the no hardening line. So you can see that the harder materials, they keep hardening, but they harden slightly less than the softer material, so the softer perlite. Um, and these others do some strange things. And the thickness of the deformed layer, we have Again, if we look at the 260, so that is, that is the 260 point. Is that right? NRM1, 260. Oh, that's 260, yes. That one is 260. So it's directly above on the initial hardness. So you've got the 260, the thickness, and then the 350 and 400. So you can see the thickness of the deformed layer is getting less for the harder materials, which is sort of what you'd expect. Then we have uh, surface damage. So we're looking here at the depth of cracks and the spacing between them. So the pictures of the uh, 260, it's not so obvious from there, but the, the 400, you've got more cracks than the 260. It's, um, on here we can see depth and spacing. So the space between the cracks for the 400 is there. So it's about a 
100 micrometers, and the 260 is nearly twice as much. So the, you get far more cracks on your harder material, but the depth of those cracks is far less. So it's a less, um, less serious. It's just like a surface texture. Um, so the 260 up here, you've got a massive depth of cracks, even though they're quite a big space apart. OK, so the conclusions. Um, so we've worked, run these twin disk tests. So co combining the dry and the wet cycles gives you a, a quick way to uh, ascertain how materials are going to behave under like service conditions where you get water as well as um, dry running. Um, so we get accelerated crack growth, which means that we could do these tests in 12,000 cycles. I think that last talk you had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cycles. So this is a lot quicker. And got some conclusions there about um, mass loss and thickness and the lengths of cracks. Thank you very much.